I would echo everything Mr. Risco said, but I would also add that I, based on what I know, which, and I am, by f <laughs> I am far from um, a, a petroleum engineer, but I believe that what is coming sort of to the fore is that things like the well design and review and approval of that, um, the actual practices of of when to pull the mud and replace it, um, were the kinds of things that, and there are any number of, of sort of decision points along the way that may have prevented um, what we're dealing with okay. now. But I don't know that inspectors are the answer to that um, sort of issue, that there has to be some much more careful review of those kinds of not, issues. Not disagreeing. I mean, and we're talking about restructuring, reorganization. That all is, is probably necessary. But the law said do these inspections, and they were not done, and a bad thing happened, could have been maybe prevented if, in fact, those inspections had been done. That's, I mean, it seems pretty logical to conclude maybe we would have caught some if they had done what they were. They didn't even do their job. I think maybe is certainly reasonable. And, and, and if you cut to the chase, they didn't do their job. And because now we have this terrible incident where lives were lost, where economies are affected, Ms. Randolph knows that firsthand, uh, people's lives, families' lives, small business owners. And now we have the president saying, oh, well, because our people screwed up and didn't do what they were supposed to do, now we have this terrible ask, we're going to stop drilling everywhere and further and, and make a bad situation even worse. That's where we're at. And maybe it could have been prevented if, in fact, they would have done what they were supposed to do. Ms. Bryant. I, I also don't really know enough about those inspections. I think in general there's no question that MMS has been not doing its job for many, 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 many years. And so I think there's no doubt that if MMS was held accountable, these are issues that have been raised by the Congress, by the GAO, by the IG, by POGO for, you know, 15 years. And so there's no question that if, if MMS had reformed in the many times it was told it needed to, then we wouldn't have seen what we had at, uh, in this accident. Thank you. Ms. Randall. I think it's a shared responsibility. Not only did MMS not do its job, um, BP didn't do its due diligence. Right. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. Uh, now I yield to the gentleman from California, Congressman Bill Bray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I deal to yield to Congressman Welch. Yeah. Right. Whatever the okay. chair. I'm. Yeah. Yeah. Now I yield to you. Thank you. Mr. Rusko, I would like to talk about the response to the crisis. Um, the, um, does anybody have any information at all? Did the Army Corps use the spillways uh, upstream from New Orleans to divert water into the Pontchartrain to try to get that flow to keep the oil out of the Pontchartrain and, and Lake Bourne? I'm sorry, that's something we have not studied. Okay. Uh, Madam President, I was a county uh, chairman myself, and so I kind of relate to the frustration that when you want to do things, um, those who are always saying, you know, uh, saying no are continue to say no, even though things need to be done. Uh, does it, do you have a clip of what happened? Uh, staff have a clip of that piece about the berm in uh, Grand Isle. Can we play that? And we submitted with staff of the Corps, and we asked the Corps to help us. And in the meantime, we got these different agencies that popped up like a cork and, and these little groups and it was anti. And it was 95 pages of questions that our engineers, and we worked through the weekends, many hours, took turns behind the computers and making email back and forth, making sure that we did everything right to question and answer. So the bottom line, and I'm going to be honest with y'all, I was devastated when I didn't get that permit because I believed in my commander in chief. Madam President, I married a girl from your part of the world. Um, and the fact of the frustration of the people down there when they want to do something, um, being told, no, no, we have to study it. Did you have any of the, the Grand Isle is over where Jean Lafitte used to hang out? It's not your part of the world, but um, uh, did you have any kind of situations like that where you basically ran into this issue where everybody said, stop, we've got to study something, don't do things, and basically we're always telling the locals no, or did we get a, a lot of support of saying go ahead and we'll work it out later? 
It was very s similar to what David was describing in this video. It is, it is, they are our neighbor. So this is, these berms are very important to us. And now I'm watching a storm that may be coming into the Gulf. <clears throat> our response in those situations is from the bottom up. We do what we know best. We respond naturally, instinctively, as, as humans should, with, with plans in place. Um, this has been a very unique situation and a very frustrating one, yes. I, I mean, I really relate it to the, the, the fact that the um, Army Corps would always love to say, we need to study the environmental impact of building a sand berm um, and not realizing that there are times that you've got to call an audible. You've, there's times, the leadership means dropping the rule book and doing what you can, where you can, in the best common sense way. And this one was really kind of an interesting one of, well, we've got to make sure that a berm doesn't hurt the environment while the oil is coming in over the top of it. And it's almost as if inaction is justifiable and less of a, of a concern to bureaucracy than the possibility of possibly doing something wrong. And I guess that's the part that I really um, think that we've got to talk about. We've got to not only empower people to make those calls. My, I've got a, you know, I've spent a lot of, lot of t uh, quality time over in Cocotree on Bayou Terrebonne and um, at the camp there. And so the, the family loves that area. But to sit there and have somebody that basically the system uh, rewards those for inaction, and it's safer for a bureaucrat to say no than to say yes, we accept that most of the time. But during a crisis, there should be a way of burning a fire that says, look, if you don't call an audible, if you don't do extraordinary things, if you don't throw the playbook away and do, use innovation, you're going to get in tr more trouble than if you do something wrong. And I think we've got to figure out how to do that. And uh, Ms. Bryan, you got any comments or any concerns about that? I've been waiting to call, to, uh, call on you anyways just for your name. Okay? I know. You love my name. <laughs> Uh, well, what you're describing is very similar to what we saw happening with these inspectors, where their supervisors are making them scared to actually uh, as assess uh, non-compliance orders because they're afraid if they do something, they're more likely to get in trouble than if they don't do something. And that's even after this incident. So it's a really scary mindset to me. Mr. Chairman, I, I will just tell you, I personally witnessed the results of Hurricane Katrina. I was in Louisiana and I was in Mississippi, and I saw the difference between the mindsets. While everybody, the feeling that seemed to be in New Orleans of don't do anything because you may do something or not have something done approved. And when I went over to Picayune, or just on the other side of the, the Pearl River, it was, look, do what you can do. We'll worry about, you know, whose jurisdiction it is later. And I saw a real difference. And I just hope somewhere down the line in our federal responses, we can sort of adopt that, that Mississippi mentality that I saw during that disaster rather than where, what I saw down south, and no offense, <laughs> Madam President, but there was a distinct difference. It was astonishing that two different political jurisdictions could respond so absolutely different um, to crisis, and I, I think there was a lot to learn there. So thank you very much for your testimony. Right. I thank the gentleman from California for his uh, statement. Before, just before I call on the con uh, Congressman Welch, uh, Mr. Luca Meyer, uh, I'd like to ask for unanimous consent that I include a statement in the record. Um, okay. Now I yield to um, the gentleman from uh, Mr. Welch. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I am concerned about <clears throat> a uh, lapse in the loyal, uh, royalty collection for the period of leases between 1996 and uh, 2000, and I just wanted to ask a few questions about that. Uh, Ms. Kendall, <clears throat> the Department of Interior, you probably uh, become aware of this. There was a set of leases uh, that were issued between 1996 and 2000. They were under in a law that was passed by Congress that was intended to try to encourage domestic drilling, uh, but it was when oil was under $25 a barrel. And as I understand it, uh, the law said there would be no royalties until a trigger price of, I think, $26 a barrel was hit. Uh, oil now is, I don't know, 75 or 80 dollars a barrel. At one point it was 140 dollars a barrel. And uh, according to the report that uh, I've seen from the GAO, unless we change this so that we can collect the royalties on what would be due on these leases for the oil that is above the trigger price, uh, the taxpayers could be out about 60 billion dollars. Uh, you familiar with that? Yes, sir, I am. 
And uh, are there any specific actions? And this, this uh, question of the loophole was litigated by Anacardo Petroleum. They argued that uh, the way the law was written, uh, there was not explicit authority to charge the regular royalty rate above the trigger price. Uh, many members of Congress who voted on that legislation had no idea that there was going to be an exemption no matter how high the price went. Uh, but the court decision was that the law uh, has to be changed in order for uh, the taxpayers to collect the royalties that was the intention of that act. Is that your understanding? Yes, sir. Uh, so it, would it be, is it your understanding that in order for there to be a collection on these royalties, we would have to pass a law to make that permissible? Congressman, I, I do, I'm familiar with the, the case that you're talking about, right. and I'm familiar with the, the act generally. I am not familiar specifically um, to, to any, any degree. I don't know if, if and this is, this is just my thinking off the top of my head, whether Congress could successfully go back and pass a law that addressed those years specifically retrospectively, um, I would just guess that it, there would be a challenge for that as well. Well, it, it, we, we'd have to get our legal advice and do it right, but is, it, I think all I'm asking you uh, to indicate is whether there appears to be any administrative remedy to what appears to be essentially a loophole by which the companies that are drilling on public lands uh, are doing so without paying royalties to the public for that uh, profit-making privilege. I, I'm, I'm going to have to rely on fairly um, limited memory, but I don't believe that there are administrative remedies when there was a fundamental flaw in the law <coughs> as found by the court. All right. Then I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, Congressman uh, Markey and I uh, will be introducing legislation that would be designed uh, to remedy that loophole uh, and provide to the public the royalties that they are due for drilling on the public lands. Uh, Ms. Bryan, are you aware of this? I'm certainly aware of the problem, and I think it would be terrific if legislation were passed to correct it. You do? I do. All right. Uh, Ms. Randolph, I just want to welcome you. I think all of us are heartbroken. I went down to the Gulf, and as uh, heartbreaking as it was for me to fly out over that magnificent, uh, beautiful marshland and, at the Delta, uh, what was the hardest was coming back and meeting people who were fishermen in, in the oil industry and just seeing how lives down there have been turned upside down. So I just want to express to you uh, my heartfelt uh, 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 sadness about what the people of the Gulf Coast are enduring and will. Uh, long after Congress has moved on to other things. So thank you so much for coming and all you do down there. Thank you, sir. And as a recipient uh, parish of, of some of those royalty revenues, I uh, look forward to you increasing that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding back. And um, let me just sort of, um, I guess, again, uh, uh, Mr. Rusko and, of course, Ms. Bryan and uh, uh, Ms. Kendall. How has this cozy relationship between the industry and MMS uh, impacted oversight and safety standards? Do you think it has interfered with it? I'd like to add just second what Ms. Bryan said, that there, there's sort of two problems. There's, there's one that you could describe as a revolving door issue. Um, that may be a bigger problem at, at higher levels of management than it is at the level of inspectors and, and engineers. But there's a second problem, and that's that, that they don't pay, uh, for, by and large, don't pay a competitive wage with industry. So when the industry's in good shape, they can pay a lot more than what what interior is paying the the people with with comparable skills and then when times are bad interior can hire people so there's sort of a structural problem that could be dealt with uh, by addressing uh, the the amount that they can pay uh, people and their other op other compensations as well but I think that that that's part of the problem so it it it, it does though 
the lack of the proper number and uh, amount of uh, expertise that they can bring to bear does affect their ability to, to do their job. <coughs> Kendall. I, I would also say that some of the exceptions in the ethics regulations um, have allowed folks to kind of get away from the, the intent of the regs. For instance, the um, acceptance of gifts because of a personal friendship. Um, these people are all friends. Uh, the folks in in industry and in MMS grew up together. They married each other's sisters or cousins. Um, they've been you know, playing on the same teams since they were in high school. And so the exception to the gift rule, which says if it's based on a personal friendship, um, could be exploited. On the other hand, if someone were to say I'm accepting this on the basis of a friendship, they should also be prohibited or recused from inspecting uh, the rigs or the facilities of the people who they have this friendship with. I, I think that there may be, and I go back to the, the ethics rigs too, these are, these are the floor, not the ceiling of conduct. And I think MMS has an opportunity to make stricter rules apply to a very unique and a very specific problem that they have. And they could do it administratively. They don't, have, they don't need us. They could do it administratively. Right. Ms. Bryant? Um, Mr. Chairman, I have the benefit of, of having looked across the federal government for many years, and, uh, and I, have, I continue to think MMS is probably the worst in the government when it comes to its coziness between the regulator and the regulated. And as I mentioned, uh, when you, uh, the Congress people were voting, Mr. Issa certainly has known that. He's been working on this for years, and Mrs. Maloney have been working with her for 15 years on this issue. I mean, I, I think that there's no question that the coziness in this particular agency has been sort of extraordinary across the federal government. There's no comparison in our experience. Right. Even in the Congress, when you leave, you have to stay out a certain amount of time before you can come back and lobby the Congress. That's the Congress. So um, I'm wondering if maybe something along those lines shouldn't be instituted here. You oh, know, there, uh, there's absolutely no question we need to change the rules when it comes to the revolving door. And there is strong legislation that's been uh, worked through the House Natural Resources Committee that would be addressing this particular issue. And I certainly hope the committee members support that legislation. Yeah. I noticed you didn't start the clock, so that's good. You know, but I, I now yield to uh, oh, Mr. Gao has Mr. gone. Mr. Gao, the gentleman from Indiana, I mean, Jen from, from Louisiana, who's really familiar with this subject. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question is to, um, my, my question, was, I want to focus on uh, the issue of uh, shallow water uh, permitting. Uh, I was reading one of the articles uh, from Louisiana today, and they were saying about the slow process of shallow water permitting, and this is a question uh, to um, President Randolph of Lafouche. Uh, how has this um, permitting process uh, affected the shallow drilling industry in your parish? The Department of the Interior and MMS's ability or, or charge to issue permits can create a de facto moratorium, um, and, and MMS has done so um, because the response to the request for permits has been very, very, very slow in the shallow waters. Um, in, in the deep waters is what has been addressed in, in the media, but shallow waters, there's a de facto moratorium there as well. And uh, how, has, uh, how has this de facto moratorium affected uh, some of the uh, 
industry uh, in your parish, how has it affected uh, the people who are being employed by this industry, some of the businesses that are directly or indirectly related to this industry? The shallow water, water de facto moratorium, um, essentially has put independent contractors out of business. The fact that they cannot get permitted or re-permitted under the new guidelines um, affects a, a lot more of the small business owners in the community. We talk about the, the four, five major companies in this country, they're all companies. But when we talk about the shallow water, that's where the independents are, and the majority of the, the exploring companies are independents. They don't have the resources and, and or the uh, resources to sustain any type of long-term moratorium. They cannot survive that long, and therefore they've begun to lay off people, yes. Well, do you know of uh, any rigs or any low drilling companies they either have moved the rigs or have shut down because of the slow, slow permitting process? In the shallow waters? Yes. Yes, sir. Do you know the names of them? No, I don't have the names for you, but I can... But, but based on your knowledge that there, there have been rigs that have moved, uh, moved out of, of, of Louisiana or companies that have uh, shut down because of this moratorium or at least de facto moratorium? Yes, sir. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Kendall, um, how has the, um, are there ways uh, under the new rules and regulations implemented by MMS that would allow uh, greater speed of permitting to some of these shallow water rigs? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear much of your question. Uh, are there ways or procedures to uh, to expedite the um, some of the mer permitting process through the MMS within the new rules and regulations that were implemented after Deepwater Horizon? I, I simply don't know the answer to that question. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with the, the newly implemented regulations. Um, I can just speak to um, sort of in general terms. I know that um, in, in having discussions with people, the I think part of the, the contributing factor is MMS now has become a little gun shy and is, is being extraordinarily cautious in their review and their processing, not that that excuses them. And I know that it, it, it puts a toll on, on the folks who are reliant on those permits, but I'm not, I just don't know if there's anything in the new regs that, that would speed that up. Uh, thank you. Now you're back. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now yield to the gentlewoman from New York who has done a lot of work in this area, uh, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney. I, I, I want to thank the chairman for uh, focusing on this important area of, of government and an area that uh, clearly needs reform. And I, I believe an area that uh, would not have uh, had this focus uh, if we hadn't had the catastrophe catastrophe in the in the Gulf with BP and it's a uh, long overdue I, I uh, wanted to mention that earlier today in our hearing with uh, Commissioner Salazar we were talking about a recent GAO report that was really developed for this committee on the revenue share the government collects from the oil and gas produced in the Gulf and this report ranked our country 93rd uh, one of the lowest of the 104 revenue collection regimes around the world. I, I find this uh, absolutely scandalous. He also testified that the revenue royalty collection system had not been changed since 1920. Uh, I would like uh, to ask Ms. Bryan to respond to this. I, I know that uh, we worked together to end the royalty in kind program and have been uh, trying to have one set of books, not two or three, and, and to uh, really get a fair deal for the taxpayer. And could you comment on this, and why do you think we rank, with our technology, our expertise, why do we rank 93rd? We should be first. 
Ms. Bryan. I absolutely share your outrage, Mrs. Maloney. It's, it's ridiculous, and there's absolutely no, certainly no excuse for it. I think, I, I think this has, for reasons I've never been able to understand, you know, as we've said, we've been working on this for so many years. This is not news to us. This is an agency that has been sort of left to fester by itself without really breaking it open and, and fixing it. And I'm hoping that, as I mentioned before, if there's a small silver lining in the catastrophe, it's that it, the long-needing reforms will finally happen. And uh, oh, how, how, how will this change take place, and how long will it take before the royalties increase and we have more of an accurate uh, reflection of the value that is extracted from, from publicly owned lands? Well, at the moment, there's nothing pending that will actually change the collection of royalties at all. N none of the reforms that we are hearing about today will actually fix that. That is something that is still up to the Congress to tackle. Mm -hmm. Well, also in the GAO report that we've had, it found that the MMS uh, area should do more to improve the accuracy of data used to collect and verify oil royalties, that they're really hasn't been changed or updated. And I have put in a bill, H.R. 1462, and this bill would require a National Academy of Engineering study regarding improving the accuracy of collection of royalties on production of oil. And literally, the first panel testified that they need better indicators, and I feel personally that this would be a, an important step forward. I, I would like uh, to make sure that all of the panelists have a copy of the bill, and if you would get back in writing whether or not you support it, it might be a way to move this legislation forward so that we actually can increase uh, the royalties from um, these publicly owned lands. And, and exactly what will the reorganization do to help improve the accuracy of this data? Is there anything that will improve the accuracy of the data that is taking place now? The reorganization itself uh, it, it says nothing about that. Uh, w there are many, many things that need to happen in order to improve the, the accuracy of the data, including um, rationalizing uh, databases across the many units of, of the oil and gas management program so that, so that they're actually compatible, fixing um, the functionality of these databases so that they're collecting the data they need to do audits and, and, and uh, oversight. And all of this needs to be done in, uh, with some sort of central vision of bringing the IT system up to date because it's horribly behind what, what uh, the industry uses. Well, I, it's, uh, well, why in the world aren't we updating it? And uh, I would invite all panelists to submit in writing ways that we can update it. Another important GAO report said that there are no audits of the oil and gas company royalty numbers that the audits are done by the companies themselves. And in so many cases, uh, M MMS is probably under collecting by uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, can you comment on the lack of audits of the oil and gas company royalty program? We found that, that there were problems with the, the self-reporting of data and, and the fact that there weren't automatic and very quick checks of that or, th or the use of third-party uh, data as, as one would expect in a system like this. For example, uh, the IRS, you voluntarily provide your, your tax return, but your employer sends in <laughs> information and your bank sends in information and the IRS looks at that and compares them. In the case of royalties, th often there is an absence of third-party uh, verification. Now, what the industry does is they use uh, metering technology that, that reports every one second on volumes, and, and um, the, the, they look at each other's data when there's a dispute between a pipeline company, say, and an, and an oil producer. They look at each other's data, and they resolve it based on, on, on data. However, Interior has not adopted the kinds of technology it would need to collect those sorts of data, and they could. They could collect it directly from, uh, from lessees. Mr. Chairman, uh, we need to look at that. We need to move into the 21st century, and we need to uh, protect the taxpayers uh, in this. <laughs>